Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the July 2022 Recreational Astronomy Night Meeting Online Edition of the RASC Toronto Centre. My name is Paul Markov, and I'm coming to you from Markham, Ontario. Um, as you've heard me say many times, I'm always on the lookout for uh, speakers and presentations. If you have a presentation in mind or know of someone who could present, please get in touch with me. Uh, we have openings for the next meeting in August and, and later meetings as well. Uh, and as a reminder, our meetings are always held, uh, at least for now, on the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, before getting started with the presentations, I'd like to thank our top-notch technical uh, team that's comprised of uh, Andrew and Betty Reed, uh, Emma Seabrook, uh, Ward Legro, and Anu Chalucci. Uh, thank you guys for making these online presentations possible for all of us. Uh, we have three presentations this evening as usual, and uh, we should be done by about 9.30. The speakers are Andy Beaton, presenting the sky this month. Ron McNaughton will talk to us about uh, comets, travelers from the edge of the solar system and beyond. And then we have uh, Peter uh, Pecura uh, from uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo Center. He's joining us uh, remotely, as are all of us. Um, and he'll talk to us about uh, the fun of making large aperture ultra-fast Newtonians. And uh, then finally, Tom uh, Luton will close the meeting with the announcements. Uh, if you have any questions for the speakers, you can ask them via the YouTube chat box, and Emma will ask the speakers uh, the questions on your behalf. And uh, if you are attending a Toronto Centre meeting for the first time, uh, whether you're a member or not, please uh, let us know through the chat box as well. Say hello. So let's get the meeting started with uh, Andy and the sky this month. Hello, uh, my name's Andy Beaton. I'm speaking to you from my horrible basement office in downtown Toronto, and I'm here to talk about the sky this month um, from tonight until the next meeting at the beginning of August. Uh, as usual, I've got a set list of things I like to cover, the big picture, key dates coming up, the moon, the planets, uh, deep sky stuff, uh, a double star, just in case Blake is listening, a variable star, because I like variable stars, and whatever's going on in the world of spaceflight. So let's uh, tear straight in. Uh, the big picture, this is what we've got. Uh, we get out tonight after twilight and look to the west. We can see that uh, the spring constellations are disappearing. We're losing uh, Leo. We're losing... Uh, uh, Virgo and uh, Botes and all the stuff there. Um, as you can see, there's very little in the way of planets or interesting uh, interlopers in the evening sky. Uh, we've got the moon tonight, we've got a nice uh, crescent moon, but uh, not much else. The planets are all going to be here in the morning. Um, this is the uh, last uh, chance to observe before the next meeting. Uh, 5 a.m. on August the 3rd, and as you can see, there's an abundance of planets. And now that we're into July, if you stay up late, you're going to start seeing the fall and winter constellations. I always get depressed at my first sight of Orion uh, observing. I hope you don't. But uh, that's what we've got coming up. And yeah, look at all those planets. Those are lots of planets. In fact, it's a, a veritable parade of planets. Um, if you're out at uh, five o'clock this morning, um, you'll actually see all of them, you know, starting at Mercury, uh, all the way out to uh, Pluto, way off in, uh, in Sagittarius. Um, personally, I don't think Pluto is a planet. Uh, many people do. Uh, that's what the disclaimer at the beginning of the presentation about uh, not uh, representing the official views of the RSC is all about. It's me and Pluto. But anyway, if you're out there this morning, uh, you've got Mercury, Venus, Uranus, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, and Pluto all in order there. Uh, Mercury is going to be the tough one to see. It's not going to be much above the horizon before twilight comes, and it's going to be disappearing. So if you want to see the full set of planets all at once, then tonight, tomorrow, uh, the next few days are going to be uh, key days for you. If I leave it beyond that, you're going to lose Mercury. 
and you're not going to see everything all at once. This is a this is a rare treat. The nights are getting shorter. Um, no, that's a that's an error. The nights are getting longer. I should have uh, I should have proofread this. Um, now that we're past the uh, summer solstice, the uh, nights are slowly getting uh, longer. Um, twilight is going to end around 11.15 tonight and start again at 2.55 in the morning, which is, uh, it's a lousy time for you astrophotographers who are going to want to be out there catching uh, you know, long exposures, but it's going to improve um, by the end of the, uh, the month. Um, Twilight will be ending around uh, 1040 and starting again at 345. So things are getting better for uh, uh, photographers and people who like to get uh, early evening observing uh, taken care of. Important things coming up. Uh, July 28th is going to be uh, the new moon. Uh, the moon is at uh, Apogee, which is farthest. See, I, I put that note in there because I never remember which is which. On July 26 and closest on July 13. Uh, it just so happens that July 13 is also the full moon. I don't like the phrase or the term super moon, but uh, a lot of people do. And if you're talking to people who are vaguely interested in astronomy and don't know very much, uh, don't be afraid to tell them that it's a super moon and they should go out and see this uh, once in a month special thing. We also have the uh, South Delta Aquarian meteor shower peaking on July 29th. Uh, it's not the greatest meteor shower, but uh, the good thing is it's very close to uh, the new moon. So there's going to be no moon problems with that meteor shower. The moon itself, uh, first quarter on July 7th, full moon on the 13th, last quarter on the 20th, and the new moon on July 28th. Uh, the Lunar X, for people who haven't heard of it before, it's an interesting feature, uh, the intersection of two crater walls. At a certain time, it gets illuminated in such a way that it makes a nice pretty X on the surface of the moon. It's not scientifically important, but it's a cool thing to look for. Unfortunately, this time it's uh, coming through in uh, the middle of the afternoon for those of us in uh, the Eastern time zone. Uh, so if you've got a telescope pointed at the moon, you may be able to see it. I've never tried seeing it in daylight before, but uh, you know, who knows, it might work. So the planets, everybody loves planets. Uh, Mercury is uh, visible in morning twilight early in the month, and when we get around to the uh, last half of the month, it'll start appearing into evening twilight. Um, Venus is out there in the morning sky. It's insanely bright. You can't miss it. Um, it's the, it'll be the brightest thing you see up there other than the moon. It's uh, heading towards the sun as the month progresses. Uh, it'll be there for the full month, though. Uh, Mars is uh, getting bigger and brighter in the morning sky. Um, it's getting to be big enough that you can actually see detail. I mean, I remember the last time we were doing this, it was still in the evening sky, and there's a. it was small and far away. Now it's getting big enough to see the ice caps, uh, maybe see some surface features if the seeing is good. So it'll be worth looking for Mars again. Saturn and Jupiter, um, everybody loves Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is rising around midnight. Uh, by dawn, it's gonna be high in the south. It's gonna be a really good time to go looking for Jupiter if you can stay up that late. Uh, Saturn rises before evening twilight ends. So it's the, it's the first bright planet you're going to see. Uh, the rings are still nice and open and obvious. Um, if your kids can stay up till midnight, they will be thrilled at the site because it's the it's the coolest looking planet for people who aren't uh, aren't prepared for what planets actually look like. It looks very much like a like a cartoon planet. It's so so crazy looking. Uranus, Uranus and Neptune, uh, the ice giants, um, they rise uh, well into the morning. 
Um, neither of them are particularly close or bright, but they're out there. And if you're the kind of person who likes to see all the planets or as many planets as possible, they're worth seeing. Um, I like Neptune as well because it has a moon, uh, Triton, which you can see with a modestly sized uh, telescope. And in fact, you can even see it from the city with a decent sized telescope. It's a nice concentrated uh, light source. So if you're looking for a, a challenging object, but you can't uh, get away from downtown, uh, Triton, it's a it's an interesting one. Minor planets, um, Pluto is in Sagittarius. Uh, it's if uh, you count it as a planet, it leads the planet parade. Um, unfortunately, 14th magnitude is difficult, and there's a lot of uh, equivalently bright stars around there. So identifying it by looking at is going to be difficult. The uh, best way to do it is either through imaging or making a very careful map of where you think it is and then coming back a few nights later and seeing if anything has moved. Uh, Ceres, too close to the sun to be observed, so we're not going to see that one. Uh, the other minor planets, they're of no real interest to us. I don't think I know anybody with a telescope big enough to see them. I like to have a bit of deep sky stuff. Um, this time I'm going for the Great Rift, uh, the dust cloud running through the Milky Way from Cygnus all the way down to Centaurus. Uh, it's a cold gas and dust that obscure the scar stars behind it. Uh, it's probably the largest, I don't know if you'd call it an object, but the largest thing any of us will ever see. It's an you know, insanely huge, massive of millions and millions of stars, uh, all smeared out over uh, the, the center of the Milky Way. Uh, if you look up to the constellation Cygnus and the sky is dark enough to see the Milky Way, you'll see it uh, kind of has uh, two bands going parallel. The uh, dark space between the two, that's the Great Rift. That's, uh, that is it. Um, because you need to see the Milky Way to be able to see it, um, you do need to be outside the city. Uh, the farther, the better. Or patiently wait for another big blackout. So there's a picture of it. Um, you can see the uh, you know just that black smear going all the way through the uh, the center of the Milky Way. That's it. And if you're say a more advanced observer or you have uh, access to more advanced equipment, there are things to do with it. Um, there's a list of uh, dark nebulae compiled by Paul Gray. It's in your observer's handbook. I know you've all got observers' handbooks. And there's a vast list of dark nebula, almost all of which are part of the Great Rift. Um, if not, if nothing is really directly attached. You know, there's bits and blobs all over the place, all part of the same big thing. If you're someone who has equipment to do imaging in infrared, I think that would be an interest to thing to look for because infrared gets through this uh, the dust and crap better than visual light. You might be able to get a good image of the uh, of the great rift in infrared. Compare it to an image in visible light and look for differences. See if you can see some stars poking through. See if you can see features that don't show up because they're just dark, but might be glowing with a bit more infrared light. All kinds of possibilities. You could also, if you're really advanced, if you're the kind of person who has a spectroscope for their telescope, and I know somebody out there does, uh, try some spectroscopy of the stars along the edges. See if you can find discrepancies in the colors of the stars and their, their spectrum. See if they look redder than they should because they're just poking through a little wee bit of the Great Rift. Anyway, there's some cool science that uh, the advanced observers out there can can mess around with. So we have comets and meteors, as always. Uh, the Perseids are coming up. Uh, they peak in August. Whoever's doing uh, the sky this month, next month, they're going to get to talk about how bright and impressive the Perseids are and what a letdown they're going to be this year because they're so close to the full moon. 
However, they do start a lot earlier than that. Um, the Perseid uh, dust uh, swarm will actually start impacting us around July 14th. I mean, we're not going to get uh, dozens or you know, hundreds per hour, but uh, we're going to get uh, sporadic meteors starting around then. And, uh, you know, get out there. If you see a meteor, trace it back, see if it points to Perseus. If it does, you know, odds are you're seeing an early Perseid. The uh, southern delta Aquarians, uh, they will peak uh, sometime between, I, I don't think I have the peak there. I think it's uh, sometime around the, uh, the break in the month, early August. And they will peak around 20 per hour, um, about a third of what we expect from the Perseids. But uh, there we've got the, the, the new moon on our side, so it will be a, a much better meteor experience. Uh, minor showers, the Alpha Capricornids, um, they peak at about four meteors per hour. Uh, I wouldn't bother going out to see them. They're not going to be spectacular. But if you are out and you do see a meteor, you know, trace it back and see if it uh, points to Capricorn. It uh, may be one of those. And the same goes for meteor dribbles. These are meteor showers where we're looking at uh, you know, less than one or two meteors per hour belonging to the uh, the shower. Uh, the Phi Pisids, the C Andromedids, the Zeta Cassiopeids, and the Eta Eratinids, um, all going through you know great big long periods. They're long uh, showers, but there are so few of them that uh, unless you really know you're looking for them, you'd never notice them. We have some adequate comments, nothing to write home about, nothing to get too excited, but if you like seeing comments and you know who doesn't, they're out there. Uh, C2017 K2 pan stars, uh, 8.7th magnitude and Ophiuchus. Uh, C2021 F1 11 pan stars in Eratinus. Uh, C2021 E3 ZTF in Carina. Uh, these guys are Southern Hemisphere only. Uh, we're not going to see them here, but uh, because we're on the internet here, you know, anybody in the world could be listening to uh, to my rambling here. So, yeah, if you're in the southern hemisphere, there are some comments there that you can look for, and I can't. So take advantage of it, and if you see it, uh, you know, send me a note and uh, do some boasting. Make me jealous. 45P Honda Mercos Padusakova. Uh, tenth magnitude in Leo, and C2021 P4 Atlas, 11.3 in Leo. Um, those are both going to be tough because uh, they're getting closer and closer to uh, the sun uh, disappearing into twilight. If you're going to go hunting for them, do it as soon as possible because uh, they won't be around for long. Oh, yeah, Aurora, comets and meteors and Aurora. I've been hearing that uh, there's a could be a minor uh, geomagnetic storm tonight with Aurora on the way. Uh, are we going to get to Aurora? Maybe yes, maybe no. It's always a crapshoot. Um, but uh, spaceweather.com uh, for details, you can get the up to date uh, forecast information on whether it's happening. In fact, I would uh, bookmark that address and uh, save it. You know, Check it every time you're thinking about going out and looking at the sky just to see if there is some aurora out there. Uh, I'd like to do a double star, or in this case, a more than double star. Uh, Alpha Hercules, AKA Rasselgethi. Um, I threw that in there because uh, anybody who's ever bought a uh, telescope that uh, does its own aligning, it always tells you to align itself um, by the star name, and nobody knows the star names. So we'll throw it in there. Um, hopefully, when you're aligning your telescope and the handset says, uh, point it there, you'll remember that it's Alpha Hercules. Anyway, uh, the eight, it's a, actually, it's a quintuple star. Uh, the primary star is a variable star, which obviously makes me happy. Uh, 2.7 to fourth magnitude. Um, 
the B star is uh, 5.3 magnitude. It's uh, pretty close, 4.6 arc seconds. You'll want a decent telescope to be able to split that out. Um, C and D, strictly speaking, they're only visual companions. They're, they're close, but they aren't really part of the system. So it's a bit of a cheat. Really, it's a triple star. If you're interested in uh, variable stars, and come on, who isn't interested in variable stars? They're great. Um, it's an asymptotic giant branch star. And uh, what it's doing is blasting, as, it, as it's dying, it's blasting off a heap of gas from its surface into an envelope around the star, making for all kinds of uh, weird and spectacular uh, spectra, uh, strange behavior, it's kind of a, not quite regular uh, variable. It does weird, unexpected things, which make it worth watching. Um, just because uh, the regular variable stars, they're pretty much covered by robot telescopes now. It's the stuff that the stars that do weird stuff that uh, demand individual attention uh, for you and I to take our telescopes out and actually look at these things. And speaking of which, we have to have a variable star because I wouldn't do this talk if I couldn't talk about them. RR Lyrae is uh, the one I've picked. Um, it's a really useful, famous uh, variable star, a variable star type. Um, it has uh, pulsations that depend on temperature and the opacity of the gas within the star. Uh, pretty technical stuff. I'm not going to try and explain it because I I don't understand it well enough to explain it and be sure that I'm right. But uh, there's uh, all kinds of resources online where you can get the, the full details. RR Leary itself goes from 6.9 to 8th magnitude every 14.4 hours. And it's scientifically interesting because it has a really solid uh, mass luminosity relationship. Uh, so you can use that to as a standard candle to measure distances to globular clusters and even other galaxies. Because it changes brightness so fast, you really want to use a photometer to uh, get accurate measurements. Uh, doing a visual measurement, you can do it for your own entertainment. But uh, by the time you've finished comparing it to your A, B, and C stars, you know the brightness will have already changed, and uh, your data is going to be useless. Uh, as some Canadian content, um, Helen Sawyer Hogg, uh, famous in the RASC, famous at uh, David Dunlap Observatory, uh, made much of her career uh, measuring RR Lyrae stars, especially in M13. So, you know, if you want to uh, perform an action of tribute to uh, this great Canadian scientist, uh, you know, go out there and point your telescope at M13 and see if you can spot some of the uh, RR Leary variable stars. And as always, aavso.org, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, that has the all the details. And once you've placed your measurements, you can record them on the website there. They get to uh, the scientific community, the data you have uh, recorded and submitted gets to be part of real science. So that's something that, uh, that we should all be a little bit excited about. Coming up in uh, the world of space flight, uh, JWST is coming online, still going through tests. So I saw a very impressive picture of a bunch of uh, galaxies that uh, it had taken today. Um, we're not quite uh, seeing real science yet, still during the calibration phase, but uh, we're all expecting amazing things. Um, Italian uh, LARS-2 satellite uh, going up on July 7th. This is one for measuring uh, all kinds of geographic changes on the Earth with uh, interesting uh, lasers. Uh, get some good science out of there. Uh, sometime within the next month or two, uh, China's Wentian space station module, the science module, will be sent up and attached to their space station. Uh, I haven't seen the Chinese space station going overhead. I've seen the ISS many times, but uh, I don't know if it's uh, in our, if it orbits over us or not. Uh, 
SpaceX's Starship orbital test flight also coming up. Um, I don't think we need to bother with all the individual SpaceX flights. They're almost mundane at this point. Uh, the ISS is passing over all night long from now until August 2nd. Uh, we're at the time of year where the Earth is tilted just the right way. The ISS is pretty much in daylight any time it passes over us. So get lots of chances to see a spaceship fly overhead uh, full of astronauts and cool science. If you're looking for specific uh, times and locations, um, heavensabove.com is where I get uh, mine. Um, obviously, the ISS, uh, it, it, you can't predict ahead of time where it's going to be. They adjust the orbit. Uh, I don't know exactly where you are, so go there and get the information you know, fresh and ready for yourself. And what if it's cloudy or you're tired and the telescope mount weighs too much and you don't feel like dragging it out there for a mere two hours of darkness? There are all kinds of citizen science projects going on at uh, zooniverse.org. Um, there are dozens of projects. Uh, ones I thought looked interesting this month were Aurora Zoo. Um, if we do get some Aurora tonight, yeah, go out there and have a look and uh, compare it to the uh, stuff that uh, uh, other observers have uh, put up there to be classified by you. Uh, cloud spotting on Mars. Um, Disk Detective, which is looking for planetary disks around other stars, or protoplanetary disks. And uh, Jovian Vortex Hunter kind of looks like a cool one, too, where you get uh, images of uh, Jupiter, and your job is to go through and look for uh, storms and vortexes and all those interesting weather things that uh, make Jupiter so fascinating. So that's what we have this month. I hope we all get out and do some observing and enjoy some clear skies. Thank you very much. Andy, great talk as usual. Great coverage of all that's happening in the sky for the next month or so. Let's go to Emma with the questions from our audience. Great. We got a couple of questions from the audience. The first one comes in from Ellen Pappenberg, who is wondering if there are any uh, infrared filters. Um, and thinking DSLR, because a long time ago they used DSLR, or sorry, IR film. Uh, I can't actually. Uh, uh, I can't actually hear you guys. How about now? Uh, Sorry, Emma, I can't actually hear you. Okay. I, I'm sure that was a very good question, and I'm not sure how to answer it. Um, can you guys check the sound uh, coming through? Uh, um, my understanding, and this is uh, not a solid one, is that uh, your basic uh, SLR comes with a filter over the chip to filter out um, infrared light, and what you want to do is go in and take it out. Now, that may be 10-year-old information. Um, I haven't done any IR photography myself, so um, yeah. That information is worth what you paid for it. Great. Um, the next question comes in from Eric Briggs. Um, he says, I would have picked you Scorpii as a variable star to discuss tonight because it went in from an outburst for the first time since 2010 on June 6th from magnitude 17 to 8. Uh, however, it's already gone so dim, but it's invisible to the eyepiece already. Can you hear me? <laughs> ah, well, I would. I wish I had known about that in time, but uh, to be honest, uh, the way my house and uh, the trees around my house are situated, um, I can never see 
um, Scorpius from my backyard observing spot. So that one, I wasn't even watching for it. So that that's my bad. Um, but uh, yeah, whoever, whoever uh, was doing the sky this month, last month, should have predicted that this star was going to go into outburst and warned us in time, right? <laughs> Well, that's it for questions. Thank you. All right. OK, thank you. Thanks again, Andy. Appreciate the, uh, the talk. All right, let's move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, that would be Ron McNaughton. Um, he'll talk to us about comets, uh, travelers from the edge of the solar system and beyond. Take it away, Ron. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to start with showing some pictures. Um, Haley had a good approach, uh, Comet Halley had a good approach in 1910, but 1986, uh, it wasn't that good. It was more on the other side of the solar system. Um, not sure how they tracked this in those days because they certainly didn't have computers. Um, my favorite comet to observe was Yakutaki. And it was discovered, uh, the uh, symbol for the comet shows the date it was discovered, 1996. And the B stands for the second half of January. And a C or a D comet is for February and so on, but they leave I out. Anyway, several things are amazing about it. Uh, one is um, the tail probably extended about half the sky. It was just incredible how long it was because this comet came particularly close. Um, the other thing is I looked at the, um, uh, around the nucleus uh, through my telescope and I actually could see the comet moving compared to the stars. And that was such a magical thing. Uh, the only other time I've seen movement like that in my own eyes is uh, during an eclipse when the moon finally covers uh, our sun. Um, Hale-Bopp was discovered a year earlier, but was visible a year later, and I could see it on Highway 400 with uh, all sorts of cars driving in the other direction with their headlights. Um, something interesting about it, uh, it was a massive comet, and when I looked at it under high power, I could see a pinwheel pattern. And I think it would make interesting science to monitor the pinwheel patterns because um, uh, it would give rotation rates and everything uh, if it comes from jets. And I looked at this comet um, just before it, it reached perihelion. Um, it was glowing in the sunset. Um, and typically comets, when they go past perihelion, often the hemisphere that couldn't see them now could see them. And the poor people in Australia and New Zealand had to look at this absolutely stunning view with the duration patterns of the different. And I wonder if the jets that uh, come from comets cause that, but this is so beautiful. And actually, I'm not sure how many things are more beautiful than a great comet. They're just so uh, stunning to me. Okay, I'm going to go through um, what a comet's made out of, how it forms, then the orbits that they take, and then talk about comets from beyond. Um, the nucleus is darker than fresh asphalt, and that was found on the first when, uh, uh, spacecraft that went by uh, Comet Halley. Um, the shape of the nucleus is irregular. Stardust mission um, it went through the tail of Comet uh, 81P Wild, and it had this aerogel, and it caught some uh, little grains of whatever it was in the comet, and then eventually it landed in uh, um, uh, Utah in the States, and they analyzed it. And they found little crystals like this that had grown um, sort of like um, uh, frost on windows just grows in a sometimes a pattern, sometimes a regularity. And one of the surprises is it had calcium aluminum inclusions and they are also found in meteorites and they're the oldest solid things in the solar system uh, with radioactive dating and it's four and a half uh, billion years and when the age of the sun is given us that, it comes from that experiment. Anyway, they only form in a hot place and comets form in cold places, so it's something to uh, try and understand. Deep impact implies something hit it, and this video shows a multi-kilogram chunk of copper hitting a comet, uh, 
and they learned all sorts of things about what was in it and the textures underneath. And one of the comments was it was soft as a snowbank, but I think that's underneath. And there was less water and more dust and organic chemicals than expected. Um, lots of comets have jets uh, like Hale Bopp did. And when it rotates, you get patterns if you're looking from the right direction. Rosetta, in some ways, is the most interesting mission. The um, European uh, Space uh, Association um, uh, sent this and it took about 10 years for it to get various gravity boosts from different bodies and eventually it uh, arrived in August uh, 2014. Um, this comet had a para date or date that is closest of August 13th, 2015, at about a six and a half year uh, period. It's tilted about seven degrees to the solar system, and it's difficult to get to a comet that isn't in the solar system. It takes more energy to uh, go above or below. Anyway, Rosetta arrived, and they spent uh, a few months to do general survey work and plan where they were going to land Philae. And this was an amazing device that could drill into the comet and do all sorts of tests of what chemicals were present. Um, they had some uh, rockets on the top. Maybe that's not the right word, but the idea is just when it lands, these would go off to push it against the surface. They didn't want it to bounce. And they also had a device to trigger um, harpoons to go into the comet to hold it in place because there's very little gravity there and unfortunately the rocket didn't work and I'm not quite sure what happened to the harpoons but it bounced all over the place and ended up in some crevasse with very little sunlight and they got good science for a few days on the battery to send a radio signal to the main um, uh, uh, Rosetta spacecraft, but they missed all sorts of great research and learning they could have had about it. I don't know if there's going to be another mission like that because uh, it's too bad that happened. So um, comets have been described several things. Dirty small balls, they're less confident in that. Icy dirt balls, uh, maybe. Uh, mineral organices, um, they're different ways, but uh, you've got some uh, black material, carbonaceous uh, material on the outside. And inside, there are all sorts of cavities because the density is a little over half of water ice. And uh, there must be all sorts of openings under that because it formed. Um, uh, I love making comets. And you basically buy some dry ice, maybe a little more than two kilograms, and let it sit for a day because that softens it. You pound it with a mallet to break it into little pieces, mix it with water while wearing uh, insulating gloves, and mix it with mud and other stuff. And there's a little bit of ethanol on comets, and um, some people get the alcohol from other sources, but I have a brown bottle that uh, has it, but I don't want to put too much in. And I'm hoping to uh, open some of those brown bottles in the bar uh, sometime when we actually have real meetings. I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, this is what the comet looks like, and it's really neat to do in front of kids. And I put in a plug for the school clubs that uh, I'm working on as well. If you know anybody interested in uh, running a school club, um, there's all sorts of materials available. And just uh, email this, and there's a website that's up now. How close is this to a real comet? Well, real comets are much blacker. And they aren't as dense. Like this is just, um, it's very dense, that stuff. And there are all sorts of cavities inside real comets. So it's close. How do comets form? Um, this is Beta Pictoris. And we just happen to be lined up right with the plane of the solar, the, that solar system. Um, this is all sorts of dust and gas that's there forming into uh, planets and comets and stuff like that. And you get in the cold outer reaches of the solar system, dust gathers and it sort of forms into irregular um, uh, chunks of matter with lots of holes in it. Um, somehow that ends up combining more. And this is a uh, meteorite from Tagish Lake. 
And somehow that combines into larger things. And it's only when you get to that size that gravity takes a significant role. And I'm not exactly sure how it forms, but I do have information on where it forms. The space around a star is hotter than further out. And inside what's called the frost line, you get rocks and metals condensing, but the hydrogen compounds like water stay vaporized. But outside that, it gets colder and the uh, water condenses and uh, you get comets forming. Our frost line is somewhere in the asteroid belt. It also depends on which compound it is. Uh, water has a different condensation temperature than, say, ammonia. <clears throat> anyway, comets form further out, but the uh, calcium aluminum intrusions that were found on the comet uh, form close to the sun. So there must have been some mixing process. And studying comets tell astronomers a lot about how solar systems form. Um, pass. I heard Don, I think it is Macholtz, I'm not sure how to say his name, talk about discovering comets. I think he had something like a dozen. And he had uh, home built apparatus to uh, look for them. Looks like he did it in his backyard and he kept finding different comets. Talk about a labor of love. Um, comets move in an ellipse. And you can make an ellipse by getting two pins and string and you just go around and that's an ellipse. This one from Comet Wild uh, has an eccentricity of about 0.54. And that's a measure of how stretched out it is, whether it's, uh, it's round if it's eccentricity of zero. And when it gets close to one, you have long and narrow a, uh, ellipses. Um, this is a comet that uh, Rosetta went to, and its eccentricity is a little bigger. And you see it's a little wider for its uh, width. And Enki uh, is actually shown in the DDO, and um, its uh, closest approach to the sun is about a third of an astronomical unit, and I'm showing Earth orbit. And its eccentricity is even higher, so it's longer for its width uh, than the others. Now, it turns out eccentricity is also defined for other conic sections. And when E gets bigger and bigger, it gets uh, closer and closer to one. It gets a longer uh, pattern. And eventually, it becomes a parabola where, in theory, the comet goes forever, um, except other forces in the galaxy are going to be there. And you can even have hyperbolic paths. And that's where eccentricity is greater than one. And what happens is a comet might uh, be going so fast, it's deflected a little bit by the sun, and then it goes right back out into space. Uh, another thing about comets is the inclination, and that's just the angle from the solar system to the comet's orbit. And there are a couple other angles that I'm not going to get into. A trajectory is defined by six numbers. Perihelion distance, eccentricity, inclination, the other angles, the date when it's at perihelion. Now. I have a regret in astronomy. When uh, New Horizons visited Pluto and flew past it, it didn't visit actually, it just flew past. Uh, I went to north of Orangeville to a dark country area and I took a picture of the field that had Pluto. I couldn't go the next day, but the day after I went there again and I was able to get a picture of Pluto moving. Now, when I show this to students, they love to come up and with a pointer, they say, I think this is it and this is it. And usually about the fourth or fifth one gets it to cheers from everybody. Um, do you see this triangle of stars here? Well, there's no star below it, but the triangle here and there's a dot below it that is not later on. And if you look at this wiggly line of stars, there's no dot below it in the first picture, but there is there. So that is Pluto, and in two days, it moved from there to there. Now, my regret is I wish I'd got a third observation, because my understanding is usually if you have three observations with three right ascensions for a given time and three declinations for a given time, you can calculate the orbital elements.
And then you can predict where it's going to be in the future, but you can also predict where it was. And then you get into pre-cover images. And the DDO used to have a whole bunch of images taken at the Polymer telescope. And in theory, you can go back in time and say it would have been here in that image and maybe found it. Um, the small body database has the six uh, uh, items that I mentioned. Um, 2017 K2, so the observation was at the end of May, and the first observation that somebody found was four years earlier. So this is a massive comet that's out there. Unfortunately, it's MOID, which is an acronym for basically the closest approach to Earth, is um, uh, a whole astronomical unit. So it's not that close and we're not going to get that good a view. And it also doesn't go uh, closer than 1.8 astronomical units. So it's going to be a long way away. Um, more comets, Wild 2. Uh, this is the one that uh, 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 Stardust went through to collect. Um, its eccentricity is there. It's almost in the plane of the solar system. But Halley, um, it is tilted significantly and most of the solar system objects go around counterclockwise from north. But Halley actually goes clockwise and that's part of what Edmund Halley uh, read about that it kept moving opposite to most comets through the sky and that made him think it was the same comet that came roughly 75, six years apart and um, it led him to uh, working out the orbit. My favorite comet, Yakutake, was so close to the Earth. So this is a three-dimensional diagram and here it is on March 25th and it was very close to the Earth and the tail was so impressive. And it had a pair of date on April 15th of that year. Now, here's a graph of comet data that I acquired and this is eccentricity across the bottom, which is the measure of whether the orbit is round or whether it's long and thin or whether it's a parabola. And this is inclination, which is a tilt from the solar system. And I've shown a whole bunch of things. Notice that Halley is, even though it's a 76 year orbit, is very far from all the other ones that I mentioned. Now, when a comet goes near the sun, it gets hot, it gives up all sorts of dust and gas, and it loses mass. And comets survive, depending on where they are in their size, something like 100 to 1,000 orbits. Now, 1,000 times Halley's orbit is 80,000 years. That's a long time in terms of my life, but it's just an eye blink compared to the history of the solar system. So, Eventually, the comets we see right now are going to fade away. And where do the new comets come from? And in the 1950s, two Dutch astronomers said there must be a reservoir out there. And the comets get deflected inward. And I just made this diagram. If a not very massive comet is going like this, just ahead of a heavier object, asteroid, planet, whatever, the asteroid is going to deflect it inward and then it gets closer to the sun. At the same time, the asteroid's going to be pulled a little bit out like Newton's third law, and it's going to be a little bit higher, but it depends on the relative mass. So this is how the comets get to the inner solar system. And periodic comets are ones that are about 200 year or uh, periods or less, and it includes Halley. Um, but they're roughly in the plane of the solar system. And given that they're in plane of the solar system, the Dutch astronomer Kuiper said there must be a belt in the plane of the solar system and it's somewhere outside Neptune and Pluto is a member of it, along with a whole bunch of other objects out there that are being discovered. Neptune controls the Kuiper belt in many ways and Pluto's orbit is Two Pluto orbits is the same length as uh, uh, three Neptune orbits. Notice that there are a whole bunch of comets with almost eccentricity one. And eccentricity one means it's a very long and thin um, uh, ellipse, sort of like this and even more. And that means the comets come from a long way away. And another Dutch astronomer, Oort, 
said there must be a cloud of comets that goes a long way out from the solar system. So this is the tiny Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud goes much further out. And the comets that we see that come out of the blue like Hale-Bopp and Yakutake are often from here and something's deflected them inward. Now this is a linear scale, or sorry, a logarithmic scale. So this is one astronomical unit from the sun. Saturn is about 10. The edge of the uh, heliopause is about 100. So that's 10 times the Saturn distance. And that's where the solar wind is no longer strong enough to uh, push away the galactic wind. The two voyagers are about 400 astro astronomical units away right now and fading in terms of their uh, power is getting less and less. The Oort cloud goes further out from that and uh, it's uh, what's at 1,000, 10,000, maybe 100,000 uh, astronomical units away. But nobody, oops, sorry, nobody's actually seen anything in the Oort cloud except for the comets that come in to my knowledge. So this is all computer modeling to work out where it is, but uh, that's probably the most distant part of the solar system. And the last part is, do we get comets from other solar systems? It turns out other stars do have comets, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And if a planet crosses a star as a transit, what happens is you have a dipping and then you have a symmetrical pattern coming back again, unless some object gets in the road. But with a comet, and this is predicted and observed, you have fairly constant light and then it fades fairly quickly and then it rises slowly. Now, sometimes it's a mirror image when the comet's going the other way, but uh, you get this different pattern and a number of these have been absorbed uh, of uh, stars. Now, this goes back to the graph of comets with inclination, that's a tilt compared to the solar system, eccentricity compared to the shape, round um, uh, parabola, uh, a par uh, a parabola. And there are a few comets with eccentricity greater than one, and those are probably going to go out into space unless something deflects it on the way out. Now, did they come from within our, our uh, solar system or did they come from elsewhere? Who knows? It might be that these had a series of fortuitous um, passing other objects and slowly worked their way in. Who knows? But Oumuamua. Um, which doesn't have a glow, so it might or may not, it's either a comet or a failed comet. Um, its eccentricity is 1.2. And that's clearly such that it had to come from another star system and it was discovered by a Canadian. And the code is 1i and i is for interstellar. But they since found a real comment where it gives off um, uh, emissions and uh, a coma and, and a tail. And Comet Borisov has an eccentricity of 3.4 and it's way above everything else and clearly came from outside the solar system. There are a number of historical comets like this one from 1665 and they estimate the eccentricity is about one, which means it came from the Oort cloud, but it could be it also came from um, outside. So we have our Kuiper belt uh, on the uh, close to Neptune, and we have the Oort cloud uh, far out, and there's a continual loss of comets from the Oort cloud and bringing in new comets from elsewhere. And, um, but so far we've found a few but that's gonna change. Um, this is the number of non-periodic comets discovered per century. That one from 1665 would be one of those 19. And the numbers are really increasing because more people are looking for comets and observing them. But this number is going to zoom because of the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. This has multiple purposes. They can find information about dark matter but the key is that it's, um, oh, this is the mirror. And for some reason it's solid glass well with holes in it rather than the segmented mirrors. And I hope those people didn't have coins in their pockets. But anyway, that's a, another story. 
Um, it's an interesting mirror because uh, 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 optical system because the light comes down, it's reflected at the secondary, then it actually bends outward to the tertiary mirror that is a different configuration than the original one. It goes through a lens and it ends up giving a sharp, fo sharp focus over a three and a half degree field. And um, they can take a picture in something like every 15 or 20 seconds. And they take two pictures of every event to make sure that the uh, cosmic rays are ignored. Um, and this can cover the sky to mag 24 to 25 every few nights. And they right away look to see if there's any new object that hadn't been there before. And they can find all sorts of new comets and new objects. And it's going to pick out an awesome number of um, uh, more comets and um, more um, uh, visitors from other star systems. So David Levy said comets are like cats. They have tails, but they do precisely what they want. And I can't make any predictions about that comet, but there are exciting things coming. Thank you, everybody. OK, thank you very much, Ron. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, delivering that to us. Uh, do we have any questions for Ron, Emma? Yes, we do. We have uh, one question and a couple of comments. Um, comments first. Alan Toppenberg says, uh, Comet West was the best for me in 1976. Haya Kuta was a fine one, and the first I saw moved to. Uh, they said, never saw McNaught, but my friend Boley in Holland went to South Africa, and it was even better than Comet West, and that they're still jealous. Um, <laughs> Question coming in from Ennio Chilucci. Does the start reappearance time denote a tail? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Could you say that again, please? Does the start reappearance time denote a tail? I don't know what you mean by start reappearance time, like when it uh, passes the sun and it comes out? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, well, Comets, by definition, give off dust and gas and whatnot. And it's the solar wind and uh, solar radiation pressure that causes the two tails. And especially when it makes a tight turn around the uh, sun, like McNaught did, um, what you end up with is um, uh, it takes a while for the tail to catch up to where the comet is now going after it goes around the sun. Uh, so uh, that would be the tail of the tail. Great. Have I have I answered his question? Uh... I believe so. Makes sense to me. Um, last one is a comment from Zapfan Zapfan, who says Planet Nine will not be able to hide. Oh, for sure. <laughs> if if there's a planet out there. Um, and I'm surprised it hasn't been detected yet because the planet would affect the uh, orbits of all sorts of Kuiper Belt objects. And they're looking for patterns of anomalous motions of that. Uh, but I think Vera Rubin will most clearly find uh, planet uh, nine or nine and a half or 10, depending on you, whether you're a Pluto lover or not. <clears throat> and uh, I think it most clearly will will discover that because it's going to find huge numbers of Kuiper Belt objects as well as uh, comets. So that's, uh, I, I totally agree. Great. Thank you so much. But before right. I'm offline, I'd, I'd just like to express appreciation for the many people behind the scenes that um, run these uh, uh, talks and, and everything. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and I appreciate it. Yes, there sure is, Ron. Uh, thanks again uh, for presenting to us, Ron, appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker and that's uh, Peter Picurar. Uh, and he'll talk to us about uh, the fun of making large aperture ultra fast Newtonians. Go ahead, Peter. Hi. Good evening, everyone. 
I'd like to uh, thank um, everyone for attending and, and the Toronto Rask Centre for allowing me to talk about my passion. Well, the two the two speakers in front of me certainly did such a great job. They, they set the bar so high. I better, I better pull a fast one here and make this a good talk for you guys. Um, I could talk about astronomy and, and tell us about making all day, but I really only have about 30 minutes. So I'm going to have to pause. I'm going to move through these slides pretty quickly. So please write down any questions you have for, for later. Okay. So actually, I was, I was honored uh, last, I think a couple years ago, to win the uh, Ken Chilton Prize for doing the spray silvering demo at Stella in, in 2019. That was, that was really a, a big honor for me. This is a little bit of a write-up that I had for, for this talk. Um, presentations about the joy of telescope making and using large aperture, fast, ultra-fast telescopes. The convergence of three enabling technologies have allowed the telescope makers to design and build telescopes just a few, that just a few years ago were not possible. This is your opportunity to hop aboard this rebirth of amateur telescope making to obtain that low cost, large aperture, yet physically small telescope you've always wanted. And finally, say goodbye to all those ladders and hauling trailers and all that. So we'll discuss low cost thin mirrors, thin, very stiff mirrors, um, mirror making, mirror figuring, mirror making. Uh, some testing techniques, and uh, low-cost um, and effective uh, spray sovereign techniques. Now, I have to make a slight change here because the the figuring and the te testing techniques is is actually a, a talk all on its own. So I'm gonna, but I do have a suggestion for later on. Okay, so the topics I was going to talk about: telescopes over the ages, uh, the age of dinosaurs, and the age of hobbits and an exciting transition in astronomy that's happening. Some of the enabling factors that are causing this transition and uh, low cost thin mirror, thin meniscus mirrors. I'm gonna skip the figuring te techniques, but I am gonna touch on it briefly. And spray silvering and D DTM is, is, a, is a surprise for later. Okay, so telescope over the ages. So back in the 1950s, in 60s, I think all of us that are of, of, of age uh, drooled over having one of these beautiful telescopes. This particular one is a four inch F15 Unitron. It was huge and it gave fantastic uh, views. But look at the price, $1,280. You could buy an automobile for that price. So, but that's what they were going for. The next one over here is 1970s, 1980s. This is Steve Dotson's. Um, telescope that he took the cellophane in I think 81 or 82 22 inch f 7.3 long focal ratio Newtonian good aperture this is the telescope that that pretty much um, set a record I guess for cellophane put them on the map so if you if you if you google telescopes you should see this photograph it's very very popular in the 1980s to the 2000s the Dobsonian revolution came about and we had beautiful, uh, small, uh, low cost, easy to make telescopes that John Dobson had figured out and, and showed us how to do it. So that was that was a great era. In the 1990s, this is Jeff Collinson's telescope. And this is uh, the era of the, um, of the trust tubes that allowed us to make large aperture telescopes and make them pretty portable. In the, in the 2000s, we had um, went a little bit crazy there with uh, the minimalist designs, um, really, really uh, light, um, unprotected mirrors. And there were, there were a number of those made. I think there's still a few companies, Hubble Optics, I believe, are still making some of those. They're interesting, and they pack up pretty small, which is, which is very nice. Then we went into the, around 2009. I forgot this fellow's name now. But he did this beautiful a whole set of these beautiful telescopes, ultra light and extreme portability. And then around 2013 um, to 2014, Mel Bartels um, out of uh, Oregon, he started making these ultra fast telescopes. He made the six inch f 2.8 first and just raved about it. So that really caught my attention. This particular one is a photograph of a 10 inch f2.8. And it really is, it, it's getting into a decent size aperture. Look, look how small it is. 
It's got superb edge performance. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Extreme portability and extremely wide field of views and very sharp. And then there's my friend here who's taken portability maybe a little bit too far. But I do know a few um, a few amateur uh, refractor makers who would probably love to have something set up like this. So some of the clear trends that are emerging, things that I've noticed. So focal ratios are going down and portability is increasing. Aperture is increasing. Scopes are getting lighter. They're on a weight reduction plan. <laughs> and the field of view is getting wider. And I, I put just starting because there really is a, a movement going forward. And it started with the amateur telescope makers, and now you're starting to see some of the manufacturers produce some very interesting instruments. Uh, Age of the Dinosaurs. So this is uh, one of my friends, uh, Dennis Mayhew and, and Alan Ward, who built this incredible telescope. Um, it's a it's a 30 inch f 6.2, and uh, the first night I looked through it, I, I was over here, had a look at it through the skyjack, and uh, it was getting a little bit dangerous because it was digging up the ground. So we ended up putting that thing away, and hopping on this uh, on this 15 foot cherry picking ladder, and a look at the zenith. You had to put your you had to put your your feet on the second rung, lean your shins up against that top one, and grab onto that scope. And I'll tell you, I would never climb this ladder during the daytime, only at night. It's too dangerous to me. <laughs> and of course, it comes with a with a big hauling trailer, so it's 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 a big beast. And and my my intention is to buck the trend to look to look for something different, preferably with without a without a ladder. So this is the first telescope that I actually made. It's a twelve and a half inch f five, and Alan Ward helped me figure the mirror around 1996, and I wanted something, at the time, um, Ron Ravenberg, who has been going to Starfest for years, he had this really cool two-trust design that he loved, and uh, I decided to, to, to make one very similar to that, except I made mine um, so that the so the secondary cage fits into the mirror box, and it does not damage the primary. So it's a pretty compact package. So I was thinking compact and portability even, even at that time, the late 90s. This is my second telescope, and I really wanted a travel scope, something really cool I could take with me wherever I wanted to go. And um, the interesting thing here is this is a 12 millimeter Nagler. So this is an eight inch F5, nice big heavy eyepiece. And I can pretty much balance any, any eyepiece in here, even the 31 um, Nagler. And uh, that whole telescope fits in that little box. And my wife, when she first saw this, she said, she, she walked around and she says, there's no way that thing's fitting in that box. Well, there it is. And there's space for a couple extra eyepieces, a couple big eyepieces in there as well. So that was fun. That was fun. I took that on several trips, including uh, the close approach of Mars back in um, 20, 2018, I guess that was, down to Arizona. So my third project was this 25 inch f 4.8 did that in 2005 the year after the um actually i should go back um i actually wrote an article about this scope in cloudy nights if you google my name space cloudy nights and you should come up with it exactly how i how i made this thing okay in 2005 i made this 25 inch f 4.8 and it was um it was a fun telescope to use it was really a it was a joy here it is without the covers. And the interesting thing that you'll notice here, first of all, it does have a very thin mirror. It's only one inch thick, but huge secondary mirror. And the and the eyepiece is off to the side. See, I wanted a telescope without a ladder. And this is a one way to do it. And what I've done is I, I collimate the, um, the focuser here. And at the end of it here, that you can't see in this photograph, there was actually a a baffling tube that was about nine inches long and it looked only at the secondary and it looked in the, in the secondary only looked at the primary so it gave beautiful high contrast images it was really it was really a, a, a good setup the only problem is when you're up around 60 degrees it's fine when you're below 60 it's a sit down telescope but when you're up near the zenith you have to kink your neck to look 
which I didn't really like. So I made a change. And I actually introduced a third mirror in here. You can see it right there. And it comes out the side. The only problem is the eyepiece came up a little bit higher. So that, that's my ladder. So basically, when you're stepping on that ladder, you have to hang out of the telescope. And I don't know if you recognize this lady, this young lady here. She was uh, Casey D from uh, Astro Sharks. They were interviewing people at Starfest. And she came and ha had a talk with me the one day, which was really fun. And the Hobbit scope. So there's a whole, there, there's a reason I called it this, <laughs> which I won't get into today. But this is the telescope here. And what you'll see is that it's repurposed. That, that 12 and a half inch F5 that you saw earlier is actually the same telescope with shorter tubes, the same, everything the same except the, um, the mirror and the tubes. So 12 and a half inch F2.8. Um, when I first made this telescope, my friends would, would make jokes. They'd come over and they'd, you know, have bird bath jokes. You know, they're going to flip coins into the bird bath, you know, the primary mirror, because it looks ridiculously uh, curved. And uh, we finished the mirror. Again, Alan Ward helped me with that. And I'll tell you, after they looked through it, there were no more jokes. It proved to be a really good performer. I was really I was really shocked how good that, that scope worked. I still have it today. Imagine 12 and a half degrees at 2.1 degrees field of view. So this would be a good comet hunting scope as well. And in fact, um, uh, David Levy saw a very similar talk to this a few months ago and we contacted him. He was very interested in this. So what you can see is um, the stars are actually packed sharp right to the edge. If any of you guys have, have had a chance to look through one of these scopes, you'd be amazed at how, how sharp the stars are right to the very edge. And I was fortunate that year because this is at Stella Fame, and Al Nagler, he goes there every year, and he came, I invited him to come and have a look, and he came and he loved it. He ended up spending almost two hours with us looking through this telescope. And, uh, you know, when, now what else do you want? When, when Al Nagler likes or loves something, it's, it's, it's amazing. So really this, uh, this became the template for my future designs. This is um, a 24 inch F3.3 that I made in 2018. It looks similar to the 25 inch because I repurposed that one as well. <laughs> so I actually sold the mirror and I, and I made another one. And I'll show you a little bit about that. This is a shot in Bayfield, Ontario. Okay, a little bit about optics and fast optics in particular. There's a term in optics called etendu, which is really the capturing efficiency of light going through an aperture. And in this particular case, in the telescope, uh, the aperture is, your, is your, the pupil of your eye. And um, what ends up happening is that extended objects appear brighter. So this right here is a photograph. I believe it's um, I believe it's the North Star uh, with the integrated flux nebula around it. This is a very long long exposure here. But with these fast scopes, you can actually see nebulosity in places you wouldn't ever have believed it could be, which is really spectacular. I believe Al Nagler called it the Majesty Factor. If you've ever read any papers from him, and um, so it's really a, a, a beautiful sight to see. Um, what this what this does actually gives you a wide field of view with large aperture at the same time, which is really um, these are two competing uh, or contradicting um, aspects of a telescope. But now this technology allowed us to have both at the same time, and it gives you superb edge performance. And really, it's enabling technology to make physically smaller telescopes. It's really quite cool. This is a, just a photograph of the Veil Nebula, and I just wanted to kind of illustrate um, what you can see. So this is a, about a one degree field of view, which you'll see with a normal 12 and a half inch or 16 inch scope. And this right here is what I see with a Hobbit scope, 2.1 degrees. I can actually see the western side of the veil and the uh, Pickering's Triangle at the same time. If I go to the eastern side, I, can, I can't quite get the Pickering's Triangle in there, but I can certainly see all this nebulosity right here as well, which is really spectacular. 
And then, of course, because um, I love building scopes, I went a little bit crazy here. <laughs> I do have a 16-inch F2.8 blank. I haven't finished it. I do have this. And I do have a 10-inch. I haven't finished that one. But I did finish this, 8-inch F2.8. And I can actually see the entire veil through an 8-inch telescope. It's really spectacular. OK, the uh, California Nebula, this is. I've seen this a few times through the scope. Looks just like that, except the color, of course. And M8 and M20, I can see them both in the same field of view. Spectacular. And actually, even the ring nebula, I can see the two end stars in, in, the, in the ring, in the, in the ring in the middle. Really beautiful. And of course, Andromeda, I can see this. This is pretty close to the view that I that I get. Maybe a little bit zoomed in. I, I'm just estimating here with the circle, but it gives you an idea what you can see. And a little fun shot. Um, me as the Hobbit looking through his telescope. One of my friends shot that. Got that Ron Breacher's home. And what has been seen cannot be unseen. So it really is spectacular. Okay, so this is a page out of um, this this um, book, and it's it's a it's a really important illustration because you're familiar with Strel ratio. So 0.8 Strel is diffraction limited performance, and imagine this axis here, in this direction, this axis here, as this is you're looking at the center of the of the eyepiece. So as you look at the center of the eyepiece and you start looking further out towards the edge. You're going to get a point here where f4.5 is no longer, f4.5 telescopes are no longer diffraction limited. And that's because of coma. Coma gets worse and worse as you go further out. It becomes terrible as you go further out. f6 is definitely better. I do have a Royce 10 inch f6 that Robert Royce made specifically for me. And it's an outstanding mirror, really great mirror. And um, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, F8s around here, which is good. So when you buy the Paracore 2, which you really need it, you need a, par a Paracore for, for these ultra-fast scopes. The Paracore 2 is an incredible instrument. Uh, in, when you buy it, there's a leaflet there that says, congratulations, you bought this wonderful thing. And it says it makes an F3 perform like an F12. And I kind of laughed. I said, well, you know what, if it gives me any clo anything close to my F6, I'll be happy. Well, I, I believe it now. It really, I, I drew this yellow line here, and, and I believe it's, it performs something like that. It's absolutely phenomenal. This is a page that uh, Mel Bartels put together on a ZipDog page. And this is an interesting slide. I, it really struck me when I, when I saw it because if you go back to the 1960s, remember everyone was making six inch F8 telescopes and it was just the thing to do. Some people made eight inch F8s, you know, the really big ones. But over the ages, we went down. So we went down to, you know, F7, F6, 1980s, everyone's making eight inch F6s, you know, and uh, five or 10 inch F6s, 12 inch F6s. And then we go down a little bit further and we go to F5s, 1990 when uh, Obsession came into the picture. And they made it four and a half. Well, look where we are today. He he did this. I, I don't remember what year he published this, but he this is his his estimated trajectory line. And actually, my Hobbit scope is right here. It's fantastic. And I'm actually working. I'll show you a photograph of it. A 28 inch of 2.7, which is right around here. So, really, the enabling factor here. What is what his belief is? Why why this happened? Is that the eyepieces got better over the years, and uh, the PLOS, the earful, the orthoscopic, the uh, 1990, the coma, the coma corrector came in. The radians are excellent, eye, excellent eyepieces. Then in 2010, the, the Paracore 2 came out, and it was made a big difference. And who knows what's going to happen in the 2020s? But this is a very interesting transition that's going on here. So really, what, what makes all this possible? You know, what are those enabling factors? Well. I'm going to talk a little bit about corrective optics because there used to be a, a belief that fast telescopes deliver poor image image quality. The images are fuzzy. The images, the background is is 
is not uh, contrasty, and that's really simply not true. At least not true anymore, anyways. Uh, perhaps those old mirrors were not figured very well because it is tricky to figure these mirrors. And really, the paracord too changed things. It was really a fantastic uh, invention. Um, paracord two enables large aperture, large field of view, great image correction, and physically small scopes. It's really astronomy really isn't the same anymore. Like when you look through these scopes, it's really it's really amazing. Uh, future enabling factors. I think that as we go faster, we're going to need more. We're going to be vignetting the light cone into the eyepiece. So the advent of three-inch eyepieces now, they're starting to come. Three-inch paracores, three-inch focusers. So I think this is where things are going to go. Another enabling factor is thin meniscus mirror blanks. So, you know, the cost of them, I don't know if you guys have, if, if anybody built telescopes, look at the price of, of glass these days, but you know, like a 20 inch piece of glass might cost you $2,000 US right now. And I think it's because there's been a, a resurg resurgence towards telescope making, but also there's a, there's a supply constraints like in, in everything these days. But um, I do have, a, I have an opportunity here for you folks. Um, thin slumped meniscus mirrors are stiff, light, and hold their form extremely well. So when I mean slumped, I mean you got a flat piece of glass and you put it in a kiln and let it sag. You bring it to the transition temperature and its own weight sags onto a mold. That's called slumping. And it's, it's extremely effective. It's very cost effective. In fact, um, you can slump. You don't really have to use Pyrex. There's other materials now that are even low cost, lower cost and work extremely well. It does require a slightly different approach to grinding and, and polishing the mirrors, which I'll show you in a, in a moment. This right here is a, is a photograph, I believe, from Mel's site again. And this is a, a kiln, a large kiln. that will do, I believe, a 42-inch or a 60-inch. I believe it's 42-inch. And this is one of his slump mirrors. And if you know much about glass, look at the color of that glass. That's plate glass. That's cheap cheap plate glass, um, you probably only spent a few hundred dollars on that glass, and but they successfully slumped it, and he's actually working on that mirror right now. And in fact, he's got uh, dual 30-inch mirrors that, that are three-quarters of an inch thick that he's, he's completed. Just fantastic. The price of these things is just coming straight down. And there is a company out of um, Montreal, uh, BBC Tech. So... Some of you may already know about BBC Blanks. Uh, the fellow who started this company and made the original BBC Blanks, he came back into business again, and he's making them again. But he's making he's making cellular blanks. But um, in my case, I ended up buying a BBC slumped BBC glass. So these are the sizes he's producing. I ended up buying this one right here, 20 inch, just over one inch thick, and it weighs about 32 pounds. These are the combinations. These are the basically the slumping molds he's got right now that he could he could work on. And but look look at the price here. The 20 inch is only $460. That, that's fantastic. And I've gotten far enough along with this mirror that I know the glass is good. It's gonna work. So $460, that's that's fantastic. And here's a photograph of a 10 inch BVC that's slumped. It's got the curve in the middle here. This is a 20 inch BVC and it's slumped as well. And this is my 28 inch mirror. Gives you an idea of the size of these, these scopes. So why, why buy one when you can buy five? So I, I started building this and, and my friend Rhett who got me onto this, he and I both bought our blank together and then three other guys uh, chipped in there and, and I've got other fellows that wanna build them too, but we kind of stopped at five. So we're doing five of these things. These, these uh, light zones, these are basically uh, little air pockets between the layers. It's not a problem. It's not going to cause any problem at all, but you'll see it in some of the photographs. So, of course, we had to kickstart the project properly. That's the mirror there. And we went through a few cases of, of, uh, of uh, Stella. 
So this is a photograph from my uh, messy garage. I apologize for that. This is my friend Carol. He's working on his 20 inch um, F3. And again, you can see he's working the mirror on the top. So that's the grinding tool here on the top. And over here is Al, my friend Alan. He's working his mirror. Um, he's working the back of the mirror. So these meniscus mirrors, when they're when they're getting super thin, the back has to be um, a good figure of revolution as well. Just fun, just rough grinding it is probably sufficient. That's that's all we've done. But one guy working the front, one guy working the back. And uh, in comes uh, a new internet friend that I've I've become very fond of. Uh, Mike Clements, he's the guy, I think he holds the world record now, in the largest telescope in the world. And he contacted me uh, late last year. He wanted to um, re-silver his, his mirror. And he, he knows that I had some experience. We just kind of talked a little bit about how to do it. So that was, uh, that was, that was really a really wonderful person to, to speak to. Uh, so I laid out the five mirrors in, into, a, um, into a circle. And I positioned them at 71 inches. And I emailed Mike and I said, look, Mike, we've got a mirror bigger than yours. <laughs> he had a pretty good laugh out of that. <laughs> Didn't ask me to bring the telescope down there, but um, it was fun. Yeah, you got to have fun with these projects. They're really, really great. So here's my friend Carol. He's doing his fine grinding in the final stages of, of grinding this mirror. And uh, another one of our friends here, he's doing the rough grinding. And notice he's using, um, I don't know if you've heard of a, of a ring tool. Well, our friend Rhett, who um, in the Kitchener Center, he went to the local junkyard and, and for $2 or $3 bought this uh, brake drum. And it worked beautifully as a ring tool. It was a thing that will last forever. It was really cheap. So we're working on, on these mirrors. And here's Carol's mirror. It's finished the grind, fine grinding stage. And as you can see, he's got love in his eyes as he's looking at his mirror here. His wife tells me he never looks at me like that anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it was fun. You got to have fun with these things. It was, it, was, it was really a good time. So the question is, why build it? Well, when we started this project, which would be, um, geez, almost a year ago now. We've been working on it kind of slowly. But um, you couldn't really buy a 20-inch F3. And believe me, we looked. But we did find the optics. There are a few companies that are making the, the, just the mirror. But it's around um, twelve thousand dollars U.S. When we did the math, we could we should be able to build these scopes for about we're building five of them for about three to four thousand dollars each is what uh, we're estimating right now. Maybe even a little bit less. Well, you know, we'll see. But it, it's it's an it's just a, an order of magnitude lower than than buying one, which is really excellent. Uh, we also wanted to progress the all amateur telescope making hobby, and do it because we can and because we each want one. So our plan is to um, pay a little visit to Stellafane probably next year and line up all five telescopes on the hill and kind of take over the hill. <laughs> Call it the Canadian invasion. And um, so I was going to talk a little bit about polishing and figuring, testing techniques, but I think this is a topic um, that um, requires a, a talk on all, all its own. So I'm going to direct you to Mel's website. I don't know if you guys are going to get this presentation or not, but just look up Mel and um, telescope making page. And he goes through beautiful detail. Really, he did such a great job with putting this thing together. That's really the, the, the best place to go. So a little bit more about uh, the polishing. just want to show you a couple of photographs. So this is a, a polishing machine. The mirror is on the top. That's a star lap below it. And it's basically doing just back and forth strokes to, to create the uh, initial figure for the mirror. And this is called a Ronke image. So this is, this is a Ronke screen. I think it's 65 lines per inch. It's just a plastic screen with lines printed on it. And when you look at the mirror through a Ronke screen, you see the mirror is, is the same size, 20 inch. But because this is a null test for a sphere, any deviations from a sphere will change those lines from being straight up and down to being curved. So you can see this, this mirror here. In fact, what it, what it actually is doing is amplifying the surface defects from a sphere by about 100,000 times. 
And it's really extremely sensitive. If you put your, if you put your finger on the mirror, you'll see a, you'll see the the bump where you put your mirror. If you hold your hand in front of it, you'll see the heat waves from your hand come off of it. In this particular case, you can see that that it's a it's a slightly parabolic. You can see I've got a little bit of a dip here, so that zone there around the 40% zone is a little bit on the low side. You can see I've got a perfect edge. Otherwise, these, these lines would be hooked. It's amazing how much detail you can get just from looking at that. In, in fact, uh, Mel Bartels, and I keep talking about him, the, the fellow's done so, such incredible work. He actually calculated, he has something called a matching Gronke test. And he calculates for your specific mirror, you give it the data, but he calculates, you give it the parameters, he calculates the ideal, mathematical ideal Gronke bands, what they should look like at certain positions. And then you can take a photograph of these Gronke bands on your mirror and drag the image over and, and put it on top of, of that image. And it's in the Z software that superimposes the two. So now you can look at it here and you can say, geez, I can see the errors. I can see that I'm getting a little bit fatter here. So I've got an edge that probably in this particular case, I think it's a little bit uh, undercorrected edge. You can see it's not lining up here perfectly. So it gives you an idea where you can actually work on this mirror. Okay, in this particular example here, very similar example, you can see it's a little bit undercorrected here. Where you see he's going a little bit too fast here. Sorry, in this case, it's overcorrected at the edge. It's going a little bit too fast. It should be a little bit slower at the edge. And by doing this technique, you can get the mirror pretty close, maybe within about a quarter wave, I would say. And then you have to follow it up with a secondary test, like a star test or some other test. But this gives us an, a way of testing super fast mirrors, or in pretty much any any mirror actually. But it works really well on even super fast mirrors. And because the wrong, sorry, the um, the focal test um, is not as accurate. It's more difficult to use when, when the focal ratio of the mirror gets faster and faster. Then we came to the next problem. The uh, aluminum coating, the aluminumizing the, co the, the coating on top of the mirror is about $2,500 US. So that was a real bummer when we saw that. So we needed a breakthrough method to, to coat the mirrors. So I learned about some Americans who were um, spray silvering mirrors. I think there was one, one fellow, Howard Benich out of Oregon, and, and um, Mike Clement, so those, those are the two I knew about. But spray silvering, and I label that as an enabling factor because you can recoat a mirror. I did the math, it's, it's gonna cost, for my 24 inch mirror, it costs about $20. It's good for about a season, and then you have to restrip it, recoat it again. But um, it, takes a, it takes about two hours, maybe three hours to do it by the time you clean everything up and, and, and give it a go. So we silvered a piece of glass and um, the place I work at has a uh, spectrophotometer, so I can, um, this is actually the, the reflectivity of the piece of glass here relative to the 100%. I superimpose the scotopic curve, which is basically what your eye sees, and the photopic here, and I measured it. So this is around 97 to 98% reflective. And the cool thing about this is, look how flat that curve is. Is, so stars that have colors actually will come through in a silver coating that you won't see through aluminum. Because aluminum has, has some funny stuff going on here, and I think at around 820 nanometers, somewhere around there, it has a huge dip that comes down here. So you're cutting off some of the reds. So, and this is this is beautiful. And to, to look at this is just really, really good thing to do. Okay, silver and jig. I made this to, to coat my mirrors. It's just a cradle. And uh, the center pivot here is about the center of the mirrors and, and edge supports. So this is my first silvering attempt. This is a piece of glass. It's looking to my garage, looking up towards my garage. And it's, it wasn't perfect. You can see the edge here is a little bit on the dark side, a little bit more over here. So I had to make some adjustments. I, I ran several tests until I figured out how to do it properly. This is my second attempt. This is my 24 inch BVC mirror. And this one, it looks a little bit yellow because the, the, the garage light was on. I should have turned it off. But it was a perfect silvering job. It really it was, it was spectacular when it was done. In fact, you can see it here in the telescope. You can see it's, it, there's no yellowness to it. It's, it's beautiful. And of course, I had some extra chemicals left over, so I had to silver the inside of a couple of bottles. 
and I keep these as uh, mementos and, and to show people. And I did actually do, if you Google my name in Silvering, you'll come up with a couple things. One of them is I did a video and um, of, a, of a mirror that was, we call it Canada's Vatican mirror, but it really is, is a, um, is a mirror that was um, made in, the glass was fused in, in, in France, brought over to Montreal, and some Jesuit monks worked on and made this spectacular mirror. I should actually provide you with the link to, there's a wonderful article in Sky and Scientific America, 1903, that um, talks about the telescope. Well, we have the mirror from that telescope. And this is going into the Dorner Museum. So I we wanted to silver it, make it original, as much original as we could. So we videotaped it. And the videotaping worked out pretty good. The silvering was perfect by the time I was done. And so there's a video, there's a there's a link here. But you can also find it just by looking up my last name. And the second thing is, oops, sorry. I got some playing the video here. Link, sorry. Okay. Um, angel gilding. The chemicals all come from, from this organization in the States. And take a look at this. It's uh, the, the kit is, is $109 and does 260 square feet of, of coverage. And, you know, 109 bucks. It's probably a little bit more now. This is a few years old. But, um, it's, it's just two, two chemicals. You also need some precipitated calcium carbonate and some uh, cotton swabs, and you're, you're in business. There is a, um, there is a hazardous uh, uh, kit that you need to get by as well to neutralize the chemicals when, when you're done. And once, once you've neutralized them, you can, you can just get rid of them as normal waste. And um, again, there is a, there's an article that um, Howard Benich, I don't know if you know him, He's been writing a lot for Sky and Telescope lately and doing sketching and stuff. Uh, he and I wrote an article back in 2019 about how to silver because this is his 28 inch mirror. He and I were cl collaborating back and forth. We really wanted to write an article. I think he references my video in, in here as well. So cost of making the, the, the telescope. So this is an example. This is for the 24 inch F3.3. You know, what I paid secondhand for the for the glass, all the expenses coming in at around twenty six hundred dollars, plus a bunch of trips to Sudbury, which is where Ellen Ward is, thirty six hundred dollars for a twenty four inch telescope. Pretty pretty cost effective. Oops, sorry about that. I added some extra photographs here. This is one of your uh, your club members. This is Tom Otfos, and he took this, he built this beautiful telescope back in, I think, 2018, 2019. He brought it to a Starfest this one year in 2019. And uh, everyone was just hovering around it because it's such a beautiful and cool looking scope. The reason I brought this up, this, this photograph, is that in this, in this telescope, he's got a 14 inch F2.6 mirror, which is larger aperture than mine and faster than mine. And he, he did this himself in, in the Toronto area. So if you're looking for a volunteer to talk about how to make thin meniscus mirrors, how to figure them and coat them, he's, he's, a, he's a great um, great resource that you guys have there. Highly recommend it. And of course, you're never too old to learn how to make that fabulous telescope you've always wanted. So I hope, um, hope more people try it. I'd like to, um, just in the last few minutes, I'd like to introduce, um, I've been doing a little bit of support work with uh, there's a, there's a museum that's uh, opening up called the Dorner Telescope Museum. And it's going to be located at the um, RASC headquarters on College Street in Toronto. And it's dedicated to telling the story about the telescopes in Canada, the people, the instruments, the practices. And RASC as an organization is a large part of that story. And this museum is going to tell that story plus your story. Interesting scopes that are going to be that the Canadians have made. In fact, the Hobbit scope that you saw there is going to go into that museum when I'm finished with it. The DTM contents span the periods from Galileo's day all the way to the present um, and, and covers the first use of, of telescopes in Canada in 1647. It also uncovers, uh, covers uh, Canada's involvement in the James Webb uh, Space Telescope and beyond. So Rudolf Dorner, 
He's from Kitchener. He passed away in March of this year, um, unfortunately. Uh, he did he did fund this museum, and we're hoping for a grand opening either late this year or sometime in the first part of next year. So please keep your eyes open for that. It's going to be a wonderful place to visit. And just as a teaser, this is a mid 1600s um, Gregorian that is going to be in that museum. Just a spectacular. You, you have to see this thing. The workmanship on this telescope is phenomenal that they were able to do this back in those days. And my last slide here, uh, because five of us are making these 20-inch um, F3 telescopes, it's such a unique story that uh, one of our a local community um, paper or an article about us doing it. So if you're interested in this, look up Rural Root or, or look at this, this, this link here. And there's a wonderful article about, uh, about the five of us, how we've proceeded to do this project. And that's all I had. Peter, thank you so much for your presentation. You are a very talented telescope maker. I'm so glad we found you, <laughs> you presented to us. Uh, we'd love to have you back in the future as you continue building uh, amazing telescopes. Uh, let's go to thank Emma you. with questions. We got a question and a couple of comments. Uh, first off from Chris Vaughn, what focal length eyepiece do you use in the 8-inch F2.8 to achieve 3.2 degrees of freedom? So in the in the 8-inch, uh, well, mm -hmm. I love the 21 ethos. That was that is one of my favorite eyepieces to use. And that particular eyepiece does give me over 3 degrees field of view. You do need a, a well-corrected eyepiece. But this the interesting thing is the Paracord Type 2 actually will take even even um, regular eyepieces and make them look spectacular. You will have a very large exit pupil if you use anything other than that, anything longer than a 21 millimeter. Um, so which means that you'll be losing some light. But I had a look through um, a 41 pen optic um, in a fast scope and the images were beautiful. It gave a spectacular field of view. So that, that is my, my go-to eyepiece. Great. Um, the comments we got, uh, Zapfan Zapfan said that 260 square feet would be a nice mirror, and uh, Drisco274 clarified that that would be a 218 inch. <laughs> Very good. Um, and yeah, that's all we've got for questions and comments. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Peter, before you go, I actually have a question myself. Uh, does any other uh, other company make a paracore like corrective optics unit? Yes, there are. Batter makes one, and uh, Explore Scientific make them. The um, okay. I have not looked through them yet, through the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe, from other comments, I don't believe they're as good as the paracore for visual. Mm -hmm. I don't know about f photographing with them. But there are a couple of companies that do make them. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thanks again for the presentation, Peter. Very, very good. Thank you. All right. So thanks again uh, to our three speakers tonight, uh, uh, Andy, Ron, and Peter. Um, we can now move on to the announcements for this evening. Uh, Tom Luton, go ahead. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so I'm going to begin with the announcements with some sad news. Uh, John Fernie, uh, former past president of the society, uh, has uh, passed away on June 27th. Uh, he was, in addition to being former uh, president of the society, he was professor of astronomy at U of T and former department chair and director of the DDO. Um, there will be a funeral uh, for him uh, on uh, the 9th of July. Um, once again, John Fernie, former past president of the society, uh, has died. So, um, moving on to the announcements. So, um, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, who's watching. Uh, we have two types of meetings here online. Uh, you've just seen one of our recreational astronomy nights, and we have speaker nights uh, in the fall, winter, and spring months. So our next speaker's night will be in September. 
Um, if you're visiting here, while if you're watching this live, uh, please, as Paul said earlier, please uh, say hello uh, using the YouTube chat. Please enter some questions for the presenters. If you're a new member to the society, please introduce yourself. And if you're joining us from far, far away, uh, please let us know where you're from. So our next recreational astronomy night meeting is going to be on the 3rd of August, 7.30 p.m. right here on YouTube. Francois Van Heerden will be discussing the sky this month. Michael Watson will be talking about There's No Place Like Home, an astrophotographic tour of the Milky Way. And we still have a presentation slot available. Please contact Paul Markov if you'd like to present something. Coming up with the DDO in the next little while, uh, this Sunday, July 10th, is DDO Ask an Astronomer. Uh, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., there's a $5.65 registration fee. You can register online with the links available at rasco.ca. Then coming up on July 15th is Astronomy Speakers Night. Uh, Suna Withers will be talking about high redshift galaxies and the early universe. $12.76 uh, sent fee, and it's from 9.30 p.m. to 11 p.m. Links again at rasksto.ca. So as of April 1st, the Toronto Centre restarted our outdoor public outreach. Um, we are recommending that volunteers and visitors wear masks. We're recommending telescope operators disinfect their eyepieces, their focus knobs, and any other touch points such as step ladders with a 70% rubbing alcohol. Uh, we require visitors to disinfect their hands before touching any information booth literature. And when deciding whether or not to participate in an outdoor events, all members should consider their personal health and comfort first. Um, as to what that means is that our next outdoor event is at Millennium Square uh, on the 8th of July, this Friday, 7.30 p.m. to 11.59 p.m. Uh, please join us at Millennium Square. Join us in our sponsor, Durham Skies, for an evening of free public stargazing along the north shore of Lake Ontario. Take a look at the moon and the stars through our telescopes. Uh, we'll have some literature available for you. We can answer some questions. And if you bring your own telescope, we'll help uh, you set it up and aim it at the moon. Remember that the temperature down by the lake can be cooler than uh, away from the lake. So dress warmly. Uh, and please check our website for a go, no-go decision based on the weather before uh, heading out. Our observing sessions have started back up. Um, our City Star Party events are currently running this week. We have not had any luck so far. Uh, we're still hoping that tomorrow night will be uh, a good one. Uh, and if it is or if it isn't, our next batch is the first clear night of the week of August 1st to 4th. Our dark sky star parties are on pause for the moment. We've got a few issues we have to sort out before we get those up and going again. There have been some changes uh, to the uh, way things are operating at the CAO at the moment. Uh, things are opening up again. So access to the CAO facilities by members and families only in a modified communal fashion with total site occupancy limited to 25 individuals. Um, effective as of just a few days ago. The upstairs washroom is for upstairs bookings only. Maximum occupancy for the upstairs bedrooms is two people from the same family. Communal areas are limited to three people while wearing masks. All CAO users can use both kitchens. The downstairs washroom requires mask wearing. Full details are on the website. Please read everything before you make your bookings. Um, we're looking for some volunteers to help out with a few uh, areas. We're looking for a light pollution committee chair, a volunteer committee chair, and a marketing committee chair, as well as some committee members. The AV committee, the hardworking people who put together these wonderful presentations, is always looking for additional help. Uh, education public outreach to are looking for uh, additional help, uh, especially online presenters and telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Uh, contact myself at president at rasto.ca to help. Just a reminder that to be a volunteer, you first must be a member of the Toronto Centre. This is where I get to plug RASC membership. You can renew online at secure.rasc.ca. Uh, if things are, if you're a longtime member, but things are a little 
uncertain at the moment. The RASC does have an emergency fund. It's confidential. Uh, full details, as well as talking about gift memberships, uh, can be found by contacting the publications or the membership office at mempub at rask.ca. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media that we've got listed here. Uh, if you're watching this here on, live on YouTube and you like what you saw, please uh, click uh, the subscribe, notifications bell, and be safe. Keep looking up. Good night, everybody.